Uh, this morning we have Dr. Stanton Honig, who's going to be discussing new concepts in the diagnosis and delivery systems for testosterone, update to AUA guidelines 2018, and uh, hopefully at the end of this conference uh, we'll have a few minutes to do some questions and answers. So take it, Stan. Thanks, Dan. Um, everyone can see my slides okay. Um, so number one, I hope everyone's saying, staying safe and uh, positive. I think that we're really lucky to have, you know, a lot of our employees who have actually gone on to the hospital and there were, some of them working on COVID positive floors. And so I think, uh, I think if you're familiar with them, especially the ones that work with us so closely, I think we should reach out to them and thank them for, you know, what they're doing for for everybody being on the front lines uh, where, you, you know, in, in, your, in general, urology has not been so far, except for those of us who are um, volunteering. Uh, today, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, new concepts in the diagnosis and delivery systems for testosterone. And what I'd like to do is frame this within the AUA guidelines. So the goal today really is to, um, go over new ideas, but kind of bring you back to what the AUA guidelines say and do. And so it's more a combination of basic stuff as well as kind of state of the art stuff. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, Endo uh, is a company that makes uh, two testosterone products. One is the long acting IM testosterone. The other is Testapel. Claris makes the new PO testosterone, so just you need to know that as you move forward in, in terms of hearing my talk today. I just wanted to give a little uh, overview um, of a couple of things going on in male reproduction before we go on here. Um, there's a task force uh, through the Society for the Study of Male Reproduction, which is the AUA subsociety, and the Society for Male Reproduction and Urology, which is a subsociety of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine have developed a task force to look at different things that we're dealing with in terms of the uh, COVID virus, specifically the science of what's going on, uh, how we're dealing with patient care, uh, what we're doing with semen analyses and um, education for residents, fellows, um, et cetera. As part of what we're doing uh, on the science, uh, we're looking at is the virus in semen and uh, there's a paper published um, on Monday that looked at 34 COVID positive patients from the RT-PCR testing from Wuhan, and they tested the semen. There were none of the none of the, none of the specimens had any um, COVID positive uh, semen. So that's at least encouraging that you know the data is. Um, qualitative, not quantitative. It doesn't look at uh, antigen or antibody. It only looks at kind of a period after the patients turn COVID positive. So uh, it's early data, but that looks um, interesting. Interestingly, about 20% of patients com complained of symptoms of kind of testicular pain, and we're not sure what to make of that, but we'll be following that along. And apparently this particular virus needs to um, have dual expression of two proteins. One is the ACE protein, the other one is a TMP protein. Um, testicular cells, apparently uh, only 4%, I, I think it's less than 1% of testicular cells contain uh, proteins for both those RNAs. So the thought is that this probably can't get into the testicle um, as well. So um, we're looking at the long-term risks to sperm and semen. Is there gonna be a temporary suppression of spermatogenesis with the virus? And are the drugs that are utilized for this, are, what are the toxicity to the sperm? And you know, some of the uh, companies that offer sperm cryopreservation are kinda getting out there and making some kind of bold recommendations that maybe people should be freezing sperm, which I think is probably creating more anxiety than anything else. So, um, you know, you may hear that from patients, but I don't think it's anything that we're particularly worried about right now. Um, we're all transitioning to telemedicine and we're all pr transitioning to providing care without a physical exam. 1% uh, of patients who present with male infertility would actually present with a testicular 
mass. We're not able to check for varicoceles. And the question is, what is the role of ultrasound in this situation uh, with the understanding that we don't want to ultrasound every patient because you know there's risks to the healthcare system, et cetera. We're only doing um, emergency ultrasounds, imaging, things like that. So that's not necessarily the right thing to do, but it's one thing that some people are looking at. We're stressing the importance of physical exam down the line. So if you're doing telehealth for male reproduction, you really want to make sure you do a physical exam down the line. And we're also readdressing some of the issues relating to testicular self-exam. Not that this is going to be in place of physical exam, but just it gives us an opportunity now to stress to, pati stress to patients the importance of regular uh, examination. With respect to patient care, we're stressing the importance of continued sperm crop preservation in particular um, populations. So all the local labs for semen analysis are closed, um, but uh, for oncology patients, um, you know, all the local labs are willing to freeze sperm. Uh, if that's not possible, there are, certain, there are some cryopreservation preservation a mail-in centers, one of them is called daddy.com, which is available to free sperm if patients want to. Uh, and it's not only oncology patients, it's patients that are um, freezing sperm for non-malignant disease. And whether, how urgent is it to free sperm before patients start on gender-affirming hormone therapy um, right now is an issue as well. With respect to the lab updates, as I said, there's no local labs open for semen analysis. So what are we doing? Well, we're offering um, home testing, uh, you know, at-home testing. There are three at-home tests that are available, one that measures count and motility, one that measures count only, and one that measures count and volume. There's also two mail-in tests that uh, apparently have developed a uh, degradation curve so that uh, they can, they've followed specimens over one hour, two hours, five hours, 12 hours, 24, 48 hours, and they've seen a decay in motility that appears to be linear. So you can get, receive a specimen at 48 hours and then extract the motility from that, which is quite interesting. Um, with respect to those of our patients who've had vasectomy, you know, what are our options right now? Well, number one, wait. Wait till labs open. Number two, just wait. Okay, uh, that's certainly probably the best option. There's a home sp something called her uh, sperm check vasectomy, which is sensitive to 250,000 sperm, but it does not check for motility. So you can't clear someone on something like this, but you can give someone a relative risk if they have a negative test that you know their numbers are quite low. And also same thing uh, with the mail-in sperm test. If you're zero, you're zero, you're not gonna decay. You know, the sperm is gonna be there, but again, you can't check for motility. Um, interestingly, um, there's a company now that offers blood work from home based on finger stick evaluation. And I've, I've seen some of the graphs that basically they look at all the hormone levels. I'm not familiar if they, I'm not, they, they do not do PSA levels right now, but certainly this would be something interesting to look at for us in urology. But it appears that the finger sticks correlate quite well uh, with vena, vena puncture uh, results. So this is an option that we can offer patients as part of their fertility evaluation if they don't want to go in for testing. Lastly, uh, the task force is looking at education, uh, and uh, Adam Hittleman has got us involved with the uh, New England section AUA for residents. Uh, there's also um, a urology COVID uh, resident teaching series with uh, UCSF that we're involved in. So we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're just kind of kind of coordinate this with male reproduction. So I just wanted to share some of what we're doing um, in male re reproduction nationally um, with respect to covering a lot of these areas. So let's move on to hypogonadism. And what, I, what I'm gonna do is go through these four areas, a little history and a little background on diagnosis. I'm gonna introduce some newer concepts and in understanding uh, 
aging and hypogonadism. I'm going to review uh, new uh, delivery systems and lastly talk about fertility preservation in the hyponatal male and how to treat um, those patients. So um, testosterone has been in the literature through the ages, okay, and it, you know, it dates back uh, BC where uh, Sasrata talked about ingesting testicular tissue for the treatment of impotence. The ancient Egyptians uh, noted the powers of the testis um, in terms of treating certain similar types of thing. And in the Rome, in, early, um, in the early times, Secundus actually prescribed the consumption of animal testis for the treatment of symptoms of hypogonadism and ED. They, they could probably give a whole talk on the testis. Uh, history of this. Brown and Sequard, who are more known for their neurological stuff, um, uh, talked about um, self-administration of injections of testicular at, um, extract and reported reversal of the aging process. And since that time, there's been kind of an exponential increase in serious research uh, related to this. Testosterone was first synthesized and the Nobel Prize was awarded for this in 1939. Uh, researchers reported that testosterone improved female sexual dysfunction as well. And now it brings us to the current day where we really look at testosterone as this kind of, or people are, I shouldn't say we are, but, but people have been looking to testosterone as the fountain of youth. And um, I think, what I'd like to do is go over now a little bit about the uh, current standing of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm quoting these two guidelines. This is the AUA guidelines for testosterone deficiency published in 2018. And below is the European Academy of Andrology, which is published just a month ago. And I'm going to kind of interplay these AUA guidelines in terms of how we move forward here. Uh, this is a graph showing the um, development of testosterone testing over time and the use of testosterone. You can see uh, that the, there has been an increase in testing from 2000 slowly to 2008. And then you see that this bump in testing and this bump in initiation of use. And I think this is really when the pharmaceuticals came into play with uh, all the different um, testosterone gels. And it was probably driven more by industry than anything else. We know that testosterone, we know testosterone as kind of an erectogenic or a, a, a kind of a sexual type of uh, hormone, but it has multiple effects in multiple different organs, uh, skin, liver. We know it um, is good for for bone health, we know it's good for muscle health, and there's controversial issues uh, regarding the brain that I will review um, as well. There's certain conditions that um, are, have a high incidence of low testosterone. Uh, in fact, you know, this first one on the left, chronic opioid use, we've been seeing more and more. A huge number of patients in my practice come in with low T um, with chronic opioid use. Um, obesity, diabetes, all these things appear to have a prevalence that is consistent with low uh, testosterone. So how do we make the diagnosis of low testosterone? So number one, these are the, guide, these are the AUA guidelines, and basically it says that you should have a testosterone below, tes below 300 nanograms per deciliter as a cutoff for low testosterone. That's based on grade B level evidence. It should be made on two testosterone levels early in the morning. And number three, it should be combined with signs and symptoms. Okay, so it's not just the testosterone. It's not just the symptoms. It's the combination of both. And these are the recommendations from the EAA, basically saying similarly, clinical signs and symptoms of T deficiency um, with consistently low testosterone um, make the diagnosis. They're much stronger with respect to screening. They say we recommend against universal screening for hypogonadism. So you don't wanna screen, you don't wanna do random testosterones, you don't wanna kind of just throw out questionnaires, but if patients come in, they're, they're, they have symptoms and uh, of 
kind of uh, constitutional symptoms, libido, mild ED, these are the types of people that you want to potentially um, check a T on. And lastly, uh, recommendation three, that it should be a fasting test, or quite fran although quite frankly, I don't really understand why it has to be fasting, but uh, that is part of their recommendation on two uh, different days. The signs and symptoms that we see are typically increased body fat, uh, reduced muscle mass, uh, low uh, bone mineral density. And those are the things that are important in terms of the AUA guidelines. So what are some of the interesting new thoughts that we're having in terms of testosterone um, and aging? So we know that testosterone decreases over time. Okay, as men age, their testosterone drops. Okay, the prevalence of androgen deficiency increases. But what else increases? Okay, well, you have metabolic syndrome. Okay, and you have obesity, diabetes, hypertension. And it appears to be in a much higher incidence uh, in hypogonadal patients as compared to eugonadal patients. This is an interesting graph, it dates back a little bit, but if you look at, um, if you control for BMI, so pound for pound, and you look at the decline in testosterone, it's not that steep decline that you see um, as one ages, you actually see, you do see a drop in testosterone, but it's nowhere near the drop that you would see, um, or that we just described based purely on aging. So the question is, which came first? Is it, did the metabolic syndrome cause the hypogonadism or is it the hypogonadism the co that caused the metabolic syndrome? And the answer is we're, we're really not sure at this point. You know, they, we share, they, they share very similar um, cofactors, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, things like that. And the question is, which came first? and uh, we're not 100% sure. We know that the prevalence of metabolic syndrome uh, increases um, as a man ages. And so really, what is this? Is it age? Is it the metabolic syndrome? We're not 100% sure. So one of the things that all patients want to look at is lifestyle changes, okay? Are there lifestyle changes that can be done that can affect testosterone. And this is the AUA uh, guideline number 21. It says all men with testosterone deficiency should be count counseled regarding lifestyle modifications as a treatment uh, strategy. Similarly, the European guidelines say the same thing. We recommend lifestyle changes, specifically exercise and weight reduction in overweight and obese male, since this may increase testosterone concentrations. Uh, this is a couple of studies that particularly um, look at this, okay, their lifestyle modifications. One study that looked at 44 obese men that were followed over a 12-week program for both exercise and diet. They showed an improvement in blood pressure, but interestingly, there was a statistically significant improvement. And this is, these numbers are different because the serum levels are different. This isn't the 200 to 800 level. This is the... Uh, uh, 11 to 15 level, an increase of testosterone of about five, uh, 25 nanograms per deciliter, or, or I'm sorry, 12.3 nan nanograms per deciliter. Um, similarly, um, another longitudinal study looking at 2,700 men and looked at changes in weight and testosterone levels. And what they found was that the men that lost about 10% of their body weight, so that's 20 pounds if you weigh 200, had an 85, per na 85 point nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone, suggesting that if you can change your diet and if you can lose some weight, you're probably going to increase your testosterone level. And this is something that I stress to my obese patients, which I think is very important. Um, moving on to some other issues in testosterone deficiency, um, AUA guideline 14 say that patients should be informed that testosterone may, and I say may, 
result in improvements in ED, low sex drive, anemia, bone density, lean body mass, et cetera. Guideline 15 says that the evidence is inconclusive re regarding whether testosterone therapy improves cognitive function and some of these other measures of insulin resist resistance, energy fatigue, et cetera. So what's the data with this? Um, there's a couple of JAMA, JAMA papers from about two or three years ago. This is looking at bone density. And, and this study looked at low testosterone and treatment um, with uh, testosterone and showed, showed improved bone density with uh, testosterone, but they only included men without osteoporosis. And there's no data on the incidence of bone fractures, which is, which is at the end of the day, most important in men who have uh, who, are, who are older, who are concerned about um, uh, bone health. How about cognitive function? So this is data that was extracted from the testosterone cardiovascular study, prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, almost 500 men, they looked at memory impairment and increased their testosterone. They followed them over six to 12 months. And what they found, and they looked at verbal memory, other different things, they should show no statistically significant improvement in memory or cognitive function with testosterone versus placebo. And this is similar to results that were found about 10 years earlier with a smaller number of patients, but a longer amount of follow-up. So I, the European uh, andrology guidelines are a little bit stronger in terms of addressing these types of things. So their recommendation number 13 says, we recommend against testosterone therapy for the sole purpose of reducing fracture risk in hypogonadal men with high fracture risk. Number 17, we recommend against as well testosterone use in frail men to improve exercise capacity. And 18, we recommend against testosterone in aging men to improve cognitive function. I think this is you know, very controversial, but they have taken a much stronger stance than we have in the United States uh, regarding this. So let's move on to uh, new and different uh, delivery systems for uh, testosterone. This is what we have on the market right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 options for testosterone uh, treatment, okay? And the newest players here are the PO testosterone and the, I, the uh, subcutaneous auto-injector that I'll talk about and the nasal spray that I'll talk about in a little bit more uh, detail. But these are all our options that we have now. We have actually oral methyl testosterone is actually still on the market. I thought it had been taken off the market, but I looked it up and it's actually in the PDR. It's, a, it's FDA, it's available. It, it's actually, this one Android here um, is actually available. Um, it causes liver toxicity, no one uses it, but it is still um, available. We have testosterone implants. We have intramuscular injections, both short acting meaning two-week injections and long-acting, meaning two to three-month injections. We have transdermal patches. The old ones used to be applied to the scrotum. Some are still available that are put in non-scrotal areas, but because of rashes associated with this, we rarely use them. I think the standard of care is still the transdermal gels that are put on shoulders, underarms, groin, things like that. There's a buckle patch that sits right under the upper lip, which I don't think anybody uses because it's so uncomfortable. And then the three new ones, which is a TID, which so three times a day nasal gel because it's short acting. And then the sub-Q weekly uh, auto injector for testosterone that was FDA approved about a year and a half ago. And the oral testosterone uh, undecanate, uh, which is a BID drug, which is approved about six months ago and is now uh, available on the market. A little bit about how these drugs get into the system. So um, the red curve here is the IM two-week testosterone uh, injection. And what we see is we see levels that go basically too high for the first day two, three, and four. And then they're kind of in the normal range between day four and day kind of 10. And then from day kind of 10 to 14, it kind of drops down below the level. Um, with a patch or gel, you see a basically 
episodic increase in testosterone every day. And the key point here is that if you're testing someone who's taking a gel, you want to make sure you test them four to six hours after they put on the gel. So if you get blood levels three to four months out, you want to say put on the gel at eight o'clock and then go do your blood test at 12 or two o'clock in the afternoon. If, if they do their blood test 24 hours later, it's going to be low. If they, if they do the um, test and they didn't put on the gel for three days, their testosterone is going to be low and it's not going to appropriately um, report uh, what's out there in terms of what they're getting with respect to uh, the gel. So you really have to kind of hone in on the peak area, which is four to six hours out. These are the testosterone pellets. Uh, and I, I kind of tell the residents when I bring them into my room to do this, that you know, if you tell, if you tell anyone how easy this is, I'm gonna have to kill you, okay? Because really it's very, it's very simple. It takes about 60 to 90 seconds. We give a little local anesthesia on the skin. It's almost like a little wheel. We then give a little local anesthesia in the sub Q. And then we make a little tiny uh, poke with a, with a blade and we put our pellets in the subcutaneous tissue. This is the data that looks at the, the, the decay of testosterone over four months. And most people, I have to say that once they start this, they rarely have switched off of it. They like it. It's once every four months. They don't have to apply it every day. There's no risk to women and children in terms of transference. And they get pretty good levels with um, the pellets. Um, how about the nasal spray? So the nasal spray, the brand name is Natesto. And basically, it's a TID drug, and uh, it increases testosterone with interesting, less of a decrease in LH and FSH. And I think the main reason for that is that it's got a very short half-life. So if you look here, it's actually in and out of the system in about three hours, okay? Um, it, it degrades over six hours, and that's why it's a TID drug, okay? But that may be why, as I'll talk about later, there, there, is, there may be some level of fertility preservation because if the testosterone is getting out of the system, it may be that that is why you don't see that drop in LH and FSH that you do with other um, exogenous testosterone. This is one of the new products in the market. It, uh, the brand name is Zyostead. It's basically testosterone and anthate, and it's an auto-injector. Okay, and basically you hold it against your skin, you press the button and basically uh, the needle goes in and it's once a week, okay? Typically we started at 75 milligrams and we dose people out, we check them three to four weeks later. If their levels are good and they're feeling good, we leave them at, as they are. In most cases, that's the way we do. If not, we go up a little bit or down based on symptoms and testosterone levels. And the seven day profile looks pretty good. You can see here, I don't know if you can see it real well, but basically you, you can see that the, the levels of testosterone appear to be maintained at a reasonable level over the course of a seven day period. These are the 12 week numbers showing reasonable levels of testosterone, both mean, minimum, maximum, things like that. So they're maintaining levels at 12 weeks. And the 52-week data seems to be actually quite good, too. This is from the um, phase three trial showing uh, a maintenance of reasonable levels of testosterone at 52 weeks. Uh, we don't have any long-term data with Zyostead uh, right now, um, but that's the data so far. We see similar um, side effects with the testosterone and anthate sub-Q as we do with the other treatments. Uh, polycythemia, a reasonable amount. Uh, I'll get into hypertension in a minute. Slight increase in PSA, which we sometimes see. Uh, the one thing that we have with both the uh, sub-Q testosterone and the PO testosterone is that both of them have black box warnings for blood pressure. And that's based on the fact that about, there was a 10% higher incidence of uh, increase in blood pressure with the sub-Q testosterone and the PO testosterone compared to uh, the uh, other arm of the study that looked at um, gels. So the recommendation is actually to have the blood pressure checked again at about six to 12 weeks, make sure that there isn't an increase um, in blood pressure. 
So that's the sub Q and now to the oral. So oral, the oral testosterone historically had a first pass effect. So the methyl testosterone would go directly into the liver and had uh, some degree of liver uh, testosterone. The new oral testosterone is now FDA approved. It, it was approved about six months ago and there's no first pass effect. And I'll go through the data here. Uh, it was actually turned down by the FDA about six or seven years ago. We actually did the original trials on this dating back six or eight years ago. And I think actually that was the time when testosterone and cardiovascular disease was very uh, prevalent with the FDA and they were very hard on looking at things like blood pressure, things like that. So they did not approve the drug. And then uh, the company went back and did more studies and I don't know the details, but basically it's approved now um, for use um, in humans. So this is basically how uh, the drug works. It has, a, it's, it's a testosterone undecanate, which is coated with a lipoprotein particle. I don't know the details of the proprietary nature of this, but basically, typically testosterone would go into the intestinal cells and would go into the portal system. Because this is coated with a lipoprotein, it actually goes directly into the lymphatic system and it bypasses the liver, where it then gets broken down by esterases and then will liberate, uh, liberate um, testosterone. This is the phase three data with the oral testosterone undecanate. And basically it's a randomized study, three to one drug versus second arm. Second, the second arm was, um, was gel. Okay, a uh, three to one uh, hypogonadal men had to be uh, a T less than 300 on two occasions and 92% of patients completed the study. Uh, you can see here that the PO testosterone was in the range uh, of similar to what you would see with the gel and it was above what the FDA target was, which was about 75% of patients within the uh, normal, within the range. Uh, the FDA requires two of three targets here that you have 90% less than, I guess it must be two or three standard deviations. Um, both Axeron, uh, the gel, and uh, the PO testosterone fell above of that 85%. And there was 2% that went very high, which is unclear, but that um, was not, I guess was just an outlier, but did not hold up um, FDA approval. The, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, Adverse events, uh, serious and otherwise, were uh, similar between the PO testosterone and the transdermal uh, uh, gel. And this is the graph that looks at the blood pressure. So if you look out in the outliers here, okay, 30% uh, of patients had more than a 10% increase in their blood pressure compared to 20% with the um, testosterone gel. So it's, it, it was a little higher with the PO gel and that's why they have the black box warning, but it's not clear yet if this is overall a class effect or it is just with the PO testosterone um, as well as the new sub Q testosterone, but it's something that needs to be checked six to eight weeks out. So the summary for the oral um, testosterone, basically the adverse event profile is similar to transdermal uh, testosterone, except for some mild uh, GI symptoms, probably related to the uh, oral route. There's only one year data with uh, oral testosterone. So we don't really have three, five year data out there yet. That'll have to be followed as, uh, as post-marketing studies are done. Uh, the data suggests that uh, you have to monitor patients regarding uh, and uh, et cetera, similar to other testosterones. Good levels of testosterone are seen in the bloodstream. There are no significant changes in LFTs pre and post treatment. And both the uh, sub-Q testosterone as well as the oral testosterone have this black box warning for blood pressure. And again, we do not know if it's a class effect or if it is just for these two drugs, but right now uh, the black box warning is only for these two new treatments. I'll, I'll say as an aside that these two treatments, uh, the insurance uh, coverage has been somewhat spotty. So I'd say 50% of the time we just get it covered. 
The other 50% of the time, it's like pre-auth, it's not covered, blah, blah, blah. Probably similar to what we saw with, um, with the alpha blockers, you know, or, or going to like a, a second, second drug for BPH, like Cialis, you have to, you have to fail an alpha blocker first. So we're seeing that, that, that you have to fail um, or uh, um, gel sometimes before uh, you can move on to one of the new uh, testosterones. Lastly, I'll just mention a couple, just an in, some interesting research work that is being done by uh, Ranjith uh, Ramasamy in University of Miami. One of our residents actually did a lot of work, not necessarily in this particular project, but one of our uh, incoming residents from University of Miami has worked uh, closely with him. Basically, this was some laboratory work where they did bilateral orchiectomies on rats and took lighted stem cells and were able to expand them in vitro and then resuspended them into mice subcutaneously. And what they found was that they were able to develop into mature Leydig cells and actually were able to produce some level of testosterone. Uh, now he's actually doing some human trials, looking at uh, extraction of Leydig stem cells um, from human testes. He's working with these um, in vitro and looking uh, to see if he can differentiate the Leydig stem cells, stimulating them with LH in vitro. And he's, able to, he's been able to show that uh, the Leydig cells can express uh, three beta HSG, which can make testosterone. So it's kind of an interesting spin is if you could actually take your own Leydig stem cells uh, and redevelop them um, or, or re-stimulate them um, in vitro and replant them in, in a different location. It might uh, kind of real interesting uh, state-of-the-art stuff with respect to um, use with testosterone. Lastly, I'm gonna transition to um, fertility preservation in the hypogonadal male. And I have to say that, um, you know, in my fertility practice, I probably see uh, two, patient, two to three patients a week that walk in on testosterone with no sperm in their ejaculate, angry at their providers, whether they're primary care doctors, endocrinologists, urologists, who have put them on testosterone uh, in reproductive age. This is a study that I was involved in, published about four years ago, that looked at uh, privately insured men between the ages of 18 and 45, which showed a threefold increase in testosterone use in men of reproductive age. We know that uh, testosterone, uh, exogenous testosterone will feed back on the uh, hypogonadal pituitary axis. It will shut off LH and FSH. LH works directly on Leydig cells to make intratesticular testosterone. You need intratesticular testosterone to make sperm. So if you are getting exogenous testosterone, the body says, hey, I don't need to make my own testosterone from the Leydig cells. And that's the mechanism of how uh, it suppresses spermatogenesis. We have lessons learned from testosterone and infertility with respect to contraceptive data and anabolic steroid data. These are some old studies, but really very well done studies, two WHO multi-center studies dating back 20 years, about 300 patients, 10 centers, 70% of men were azospermic after six months. Interestingly, there was a difference between uh, Asian men who only suppressed to about 50% and Caucasian men that suppressed to about 90%. Uh, once the testosterone was discontinued, the sperm recovery was, was present on an average, again, in about 3.7 um, months. The second WHO study, big uh, international study, 15 center, nine countries, uh, 400 volunteers, 98% of patients suppress spermatogenesis to less than 3 million in the study, suggesting that clearly testosterone could be utilized to some degree as a contraceptive. Um, the lessons learned from anabolic steroids and infertility, um, there are several kind of studies looking at this. This is some of our data dating back about 10, 15 years, but basically we looked at our patients 
uh, who presented with infertility, 80% um, of them had no sperm, about 20% had low numbers, and this was kind of across the board, one cycle of testosterone versus continuous use. Um, most of the time, this is re was reversible, about 80% of the time, but about 20% of the time, uh, men who were on anabolic steroids, usually long-term, were not reversible. When they were reversible, many times it was just stopping the drug, but many times they needed some supplementation, whether it was HCG or clomiphene citrate or things like that. So let's go to the guidelines for testosterone and fertility, okay? So guideline 10, men with testosterone deficiency uh, should have a reproductive health evaluation, grade level B. Now, what, what does that mean? That means simply just ask the question. Before you put someone on testosterone, just ask them, do you have any interest in fertility in the future? And it can be a 20-year-old, it can be a 30-year-old, it can be a 40-year-old, it can be a 50-year-old. I can't tell you how many 50-year-olds I've seen who have not been asked about that who are still wanting to be fathers. So really, it's as simple as just asking one question. Do you have any interest in fertility moving forward? Uh, guideline 16, long-term uh, impact of exogenous testosterone on spermatogenesis should be discussed in patients who are interested in fertility. And clinicians may use other off-label treatments. So aromatase inhibitors, HCG, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators such as clomiphene citrate or tamoxifen or a combination in men who uh, have testosterone deficiency desiring or maintain maintaining fertility. And the EAA guidelines similarly say uh, we recommend to consider gonadotropin therapy in men who, uh, when fertility is desired. So what are our options uh, in patients who are on testosterone? Well, you stop their testosterone, okay? And if they're interested in fertility, I'll go over the data with starting HCG plus and minus testosterone, clomiphene, aromatase, and uh, the nasal spray. So. This is an interesting study uh, done by Mike Shea, who's actually in uh, San Diego now. He's done when he was a fellow with Larry Lipschultz. And basically, this was men who were put on testosterone, but they were put on once a week um, intramuscular HCG. And what they found was that if you could stimulate the Leydig cells with HCG, even though you were given that exogenous testosterone, that you could maintain your spermatogenesis. So if I have a guy who is maybe in his 20s or 30s and he has some level of either hypogonadal hypogonadism or low T and he wants treatment, many times I may put him on a low dose of T, but I'll give him this stimulus of HCG as well because a lot of times just symptomatically they don't feel as well on the HCG as they feel on the testosterone. How about the nasal spray? So we talked about this a little earlier, um, it's a TID dr drug and it kind of peaks and spikes real quick. So you see that bump in testosterone and then it comes down. Well, maybe what happens is in between um, the exogenous testosterone going down, uh, the body brain sees this and you don't see as a significant drop in FSH and LH as you do to essentially undetected, undetectable levels with other uh, testosterones. And interesting, if you look at the data, there is a drop in sperm count and uh, total modal sperm, but it's not as dramatic as one sees with the other testosterone. So um, this, this may have a role in men who want to preserve spermatogenesis. The last thing that I'll talk about is the other uh, treatments, which is clomiphene citrate. Clomiphene is an anti-estrogen. It feeds back on the pituitary and shuts off or actually stimulates the pituitary to make more LH, which will work directly on the Leydig cells to make intratesticular testosterone. There's good data to show if you look at um, levels of testosterone comparing clomiphene citrate to T-gel, that there is a statistically significant improvement in testosterone with clomiphene citrate. And there is data to show that you see symptom improvement as well. Now, I have to say, even though this is published 
data. This is observational data. I can tell you that just anecdotally, um, patients don't feel as good with clomiphene citrate as they do with exogenous testosterone. I don't really understand why. Uh, it's not completely clear, but I, I can tell you that a lot of us that do a lot of this feel that, that you just don't, you don't get the same symptomatic improvement, but it does uh, maintain spermatogenesis. We use aromatase inhibitors um, in patients who have a low testosterone and may have high estrogen. Usually it's in uh, obese men. And basically uh, this drug will block the conversion of testosterone to estrogen uh, and will uh, increase uh, testosterone levels. So the summary here, basically exogenous T supplementation decreases sperm production. The studies of hormone contraception as well as anabolic steroids show that you see it a return of normal sperm production typically within a year uh, after discontinuation. Um, and the uh, serotonin, I'm sorry, uh, this is the selective estrogen receptor modulators, clomiphene citrate, aromatase inhibitors, and HCG are safe and effective, even though they're off label for treating a hypogonadism in men who desire fertility. Again, uh, these are the AUA guidelines that say, hey, just ask the simple question, hey, are you have any interest in fertility and uh, before you put a patient on testosterone because you may want to temper your treatment, discuss the long-term impact of spermatogenesis and that these, are, these treatments are available. The clomiphene citrate, the HCG, et cetera, can be used in these patients. So um, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked a little bit about aging and uh, testosterone decline, whether it's aging or it's metabolic syndrome. We've introduced some of the new delivery systems, the PO testosterone undecanate and the sub-Q once a week uh, testosterone enanthate. And we've kind of reiterated the importance of fertility preservation in this population and tried to kind of spring it in with all the, uh, the AUA uh, guideline updates with these two uh, groups that are uh, that have set the guidelines for us. So I'll stop here. Um, I guess, I don't know if I muted everybody, but um, maybe muted. Jody I'm can muted. unmute. And I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, male reproduction, and COVID or, or hypogonadism. Dr. Honey, you do already have a chat question from Dr. Joseph Brito. Interested in, uh, interested, you know, how you handle patients with normal total T, but low bioavailable, how do you counsel? And everyone does have the ability to unmute themselves to ask a question. So um, that's a good question, Joe. And I, I, I typically don't check free testosterone unless I have a patient who would, for some reason, have high uh, binding globulin to suggest that it would be more bound than usual. Uh, so a patient with liver disease, um, th those are, typically those are the only patients that I'll check the HBG and, and then check a free testosterone. I, I try to keep it simple with, with more of the, the, the total testosterone than anything else. I see that Dr. Rotsoff raised his hand from the room. Hey, can you hear me, Stan? Yeah. Uh, two, two questions basically on the aromatase inhibitors. Um, is there any, uh, I know there's some guidelines about guys who've been on it, you know, on Arimidex for a long time to get, um, to get an annual bone scan. I talked to uh, Ramasamy about that. He said he doesn't do it because um, generally that's recommended for women who are on that, who obviously don't have as much testosterone to kind of offset the absence of estrogen. So, you know, do you do an annual bone scan is my question. And number two, and same uh, subject, I've had guys who have not responded to uh, Arimidex to anastrozole, but for some reason do much better on letrozole. Have you seen that? Um, the answer to the first question is somewhat tricky in that we don't really know what is the most important hormone for uh, osteoporosis and bone density. So some people think it's estrogen, some people think it's testosterone, some people think that some level of estrogen is important. And if you lower the estrogen too low, that you actually put men at risk for um, 
a high risk of osteoporosis. I, I mean, honestly, I have a very small percentage of people who are on a Rimidex. Typically, yeah. it's only if they have like gonicomastia or all of a sudden they want to watch the Hallmark Channel instead of watching, uh, you know, pro football. Just kidding. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Uh, Second question is most people respond to a Rimidex. I've had a couple of people who have had side effects with the Rimidex that have switched to uh, letrozole, but I, I really, you know, even in my population, it's really not that big to, uh, to utilize in a major way. All right, thanks. Great talk, appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, Stan, Kellner. Yeah, Stan uh, Kellner, I just have a quick question. You didn't really mention um, what your workup is for uh, a man who comes in with um, symptoms of hypogonadism, in terms of laboratory testing, can you can you just go over again which labs you order, um, what time of day, and and also is thyroid important to check when you're working up hypogonadism? Right. So what I normally do, is, you know, you know, just for and this is kind of the algorithm. I'll, you know, most patients come in with one or two testosterones. I'll make sure it's a morning testosterone um, for complete. You know, most people have basically late onset hypogonadism unless they have risk factors for hypogonadotropic such as um, opioid use, uh, anabolic steroid use, things like that. But typically I'll do a testosterone, I'll do a prolactin, uh, I'll do an LH and I'll do an FSH. And unless there's clear hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, there's really no further testing that is necessary. I'll also get a baseline CBC and I'll get a baseline PSA. Uh, and the guidelines say basically you should check the CBC and the PSA once every four months for the first year. And then it goes to every six months and kind of depending upon what you read once a year in terms of uh, PSA. About, I'd say 10% will develop polycythemia. And those patients uh, sometimes we'll lower their dose of testosterone. Sometimes we'll just ask them to donate a unit of the blood. You can do, you know, to, a, a good deed for the price of um, lowering your your uh, hematocrit. Um, and if not, we'll send them up for lo phlebotomy. My, it's interesting because I've actually spoken to the um, hematologist, and if you look at their published data on this, they actually don't treat people unless their hematocrit goes up to sixty which I think is a little crazy. Once, once I, they get up to about 54, 55, I, I get concerned unless they're symptomatic. Um, the PSA, um, I, I'll throw in these. I just put up a slide, if you can see, for the guidelines here. So guidelines 17 and 18. Uh, clinicians should inform patients of the absence of evidence linking testosterone therapy to the development of prostate cancer. And that's grade B evidence. So um, do I check PSAs? Yes, um, but the guidelines say there's absence of evidence. And um, 18, uh, I didn't get into this, but patients with testosterone deficiency and a history of prostate cancer should be informed that there is inadequate evidence to quantify um, the, the risk benefit ratio. I didn't go into the. I didn't uh, get that. Try tapping above to edit. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the, I guess that would be my best response at this point. Okay. Any questions out there, Jody? Um, Doctor Dinesh Singh, no check, no checking LFTs. Um. No checking LFTs. Um, you know, I have I don't have a lot of experience using the PO testosterone. Um, the data shows that there does not seem to be a change in LFT. So, checking LFTs is not recommended in patients for testosterone. I I will probably check LFTs on the people who have PO testosterone just for completeness sake. Um, but no, LFTs are not necessary. And so Dan, I have one, one more question for you. If you start someone on uh, therapy, um, is there an end point? I mean, is there a point where you should try to stop their therapy or is it something that you just have to rely on for the rest of your life? 
So that's a good question in that, like, I try to stress the lifestyle issues. So um, generally speaking, if you have a thin guy who has a low testosterone, it's really lifelong therapy. And if they get symptomatic improvement and they do well, they really need it for life, okay? Now, if you have the obese guy who could shed 20 pounds or 40 pounds or 100 pounds, which is probably 80% of the people that we see, I really stress the concept of lifestyle changes. So I say to them, if you can lose 20 pounds, you may be able to get off your testosterone. So I think part of the whole concept here is not just to give out testosterone, but to try to be a good doctor and say, hey, look, there are lifestyle issues that can be done as well. So um, I, I guess that would be the best answer to that question. All right, well, thanks everybody. Oh, hold on, I got, I got one. I got, a, I got a text from Dr. Martin. Okay, can you talk about how you manage patients who have a PSA elevation that occur on T replacement and also T replacement and post-treatment prostate cancer patient? Good question. So um, I treat them the same way as I, I would uh, in any other patient who bumps his PSA. Uh, sometimes we'll stop their testosterone and see if their PSA goes back down, but most of the time um, it, it doesn't. So I, I treat them the same as I would any patient who has um, prostate, who has a bump in PSA. With respect to the post-treatment prostate cancer, just as briefly as I can here, these are the three groups, active surveillance, post-radical prostatectomy, post-XRT and advanced disease. Post-radical, the guidelines basically say, um, if, you've, if you have a PSA that's undetectable after two years, and you're free of disease, you can consider testosterone therapy. Uh, similarly, for post-XRT, three nadir PSAs, you consider, consider uh, T replacement. Um, active surveillance and advanced disease. Um, here's a study from John Mulhall from last year's SMSNA looking at men on active surveillance. And the conversion rates seem to be no higher then the general um, active, the active surveillance population seems to be no higher than the ones testosterone versus no testosterone um, in that group. But, but again, this is short-term data, okay? And N is 86, okay? And then lastly, um, the high-grade patients, this is um, post-radical prostatectomy patients with unfavorable pathology, seminal vesicle involvement, three groups, normal T, low T and no treatment, low T and treatment, there seem to be similar recurrence rates, um, whether you're on testosterone or not. Uh, and the follow-up was one month to 15 years. So again, you know, wide ranges of follow-up. But, um, you know, I, I get worried about guys with high-grade disease still. Uh, the active surveillance, I certainly have a group of patients on that and a lot of people who post radical post uh, XRT. I'd love to comment on that if you don't mind or get your input, Stan. I mean, I, my personal approach and feeling about this is if someone is hypogonadal, you basically have them on androgen deprivation. And so you're treating them for something that they may not have in terms of PSA recurrence. So um, I believe that there is some data um, from Boston that suggests having men be eugonadal is actually protective from adverse and bad prostate cancer. And hypogonadal men tend to get a sort of even more aggressive prostate cancer. So um, if someone's PSA is going up and they're on T, I would actually say don't stop their testosterone, continue their testosterone and evaluate them for prostate cancer. Um, I think if someone is hypogonadal, uh, and you should correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on any of this, Stan, but if someone's hypogonadal, having them be eugonadal is, is the most appropriate way to evaluate them for prostate cancer. And you're kind of obscuring or hiding what their actual risk is if you're manipulating their T or taking them on and off. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean basically I say, you know, treat them as you would any other patient um, who has an elevation in PSA. So I, I, I agree, you're kind of 
it's almost like a little bit of a stress test if you can argue that, you know, but uh, um, I think that data is a little vague, but I, you know, I, I have to tell you that the number of people that have increased their PSA on T replacement has been minuscule in my patient population so far. There was one question from someone on, uh, what do I tell you, say about VTE risk? Um, I think I would put that in the, the evidence is inconclusive with respect to that. The, the data with cardiovascular disease, VTE, um, I'd say is pretty vague at this point. There are papers that show uh, slightly higher increases. There are papers that show no difference. So uh, I, I don't, I don't include that. Well, I shouldn't say I don't include it. I, I discuss it with my patients, but I don't kind of stress it that, you know, I say that the data is inconclusive at this point. It's Dan, this is Bruce. Wasn't that Campbell's presentation a couple of years ago about um, folks with hypogonadism being at a higher baseline risk of cardiovascular disease and it's not necessarily the supplementation that the issue, that's the issue? Well, it's a pretty controversial area in that um, most of the published data just looking at hypogonadal men show that they're at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and that testosterone is more protective than anything else. The studies that were done that got everyone all kind of riled up were kind of poorly done studies. 20% uh, never had testosterone levels checked afterwards. The follow-up was kind of poor. Uh, it was really based on poor data. So it got everyone uh, kind of worked up. It got the FDA so worked up that they put a black box warning on testosterone saying that we don't, we don't know what the, we don't know uh, what the cardiovascular risks are for this. In fact, I did read the, uh, the guideline comment on that, which is, let's see. Patients should be informed that there is no definitive evidence linking testosterone therapy to a higher incidence of VTEs, grade level C. Prior to initiating treatment, and I think this is important, clinicians should counsel patients that at this time, it cannot be stated definitively whether testosterone therapy increases or decreases the risk of cardiovascular events i.e. myocardial infarction, stroke, et cetera. But we do recommend if someone's had an, a cardiovascular event, stroke, et cetera, that we hold off on, on testosterone therapy for at least six months after that. All right, well, I'm gonna stop here. Um, thanks everybody, be safe and uh, uh, stay positive. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Stan.